I'm living the dream, sir. How are you guys? How do you like that I just moved your office to Frederick, Maryland? Well, I was wondering. I was like, is there something I don't know that I need to be aware of? But we're, we're, we're tucked away right here in Martinsburg. John and I have been discussing opening up a branch there, so I'm just uh, telling you, kind of uh, broke the surprise, <laughs> I guess. dropped a bomb on me <laughs> Monday morning. Huh? You get a longer commute starting Monday, Phil, next week. Yeah. Get used to it. You have to you have to book me some more for more time on the, on the air than if I'm driving to Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> you get to live my life for a little while, uh, <laughs> Phil. Let's talk a little football first and foremost. Uh, I, I want to start with college football because the national championship game is tonight. Uh, Colin, I don't know if you want to click off the recording and, and chime in here as well because this is kind of a fascinating thing. Uh, I thought this would be the last oh. Monday night game of the year because college football always plays its championship game on Monday night. But then I saw the NFL is doing a playoff game next Monday night, and I'm baffled by when we started doing playoff games on Monday night in the NFL. Phil, Colin, John, Bill, do you guys ever remember an NFL Monday night football playoff game? I believe it started I last year. Did they do it last year, Colin? Yeah, I think it started uh, last year or whenever they started this super wild card weekend with the seven teams, they, I think, decided last year to have one on Monday night. Phil, do you recall that? I don't. I remember three on Saturday and three on Sunday, but I'll defer to Colin. I'm sure he, he knows, and, and I probably don't. But I, the um, it, it blows my mind, though, because that team is at an immediate disadvantage, the winner of that team, because they're going to have a shortened week. And... But I, I, I don't recall it, but the uh, it, it doesn't surprise me because the NFL's making their way to seemingly every single night of the week. They, they you know, they threw the, the Thursday games in and then multiple Monday games, and you got Saturday games toward the end of the season. So the, I, I'm, I'm still a fan of Sunday, Monday, and that's it. But the during the season and then during the playoffs, Saturday and Sunday, and that's it. But – it is what it is. I mean, it's it's America's game, it seems, and, and people will watch. I don't care when it is. People are going to watch. So uh, Colin's looking that up to see if they did it last year or, or not. Uh, but tonight we do have the national championship game for college football, which I think should be played on a Saturday night, not a Monday night. But it's too much TV money to not do it on a Monday night, I guess. And they start it late. So I complain because I have to wake up early and I never get to watch it except on a replay. But you've got TCU and Georgia. Georgia looking to repeat here. So I'm going to go around and I want to get some picks on this one. I'll start with you first, John Gilstrap. I'm going to ask you to talk a little sports here with me and give us a, a prediction. Georgia, well, as, TCU. As, as you know, football is my life. Mm-hmm. So I'll, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'll go with Georgia. Georgia is a safe pick. Okay. Right? There you go. SEC, defending champions. Go with Georgia. I am pulling all of my money out of the 401k, and I'm putting it down on Georgia. You, you may actually, you know, win if well, you do that. Uh, Billy? Uh, financially, if I was betting, Georgia all the way. However, emotionally, I'm going to be pulling for TCU as hard as I can. How about Colin? Realistically, probably should pick Georgia the safer bet when you look at the spread, the talent that the two teams have, but it's kind of tough not to go for TCU just because of the season that they've had and being down, I believe, every single game they've played going into halftime or something mm-hmm. close to that and still managing to go 13-1 and this year, the only loss in the Big 12 championship. So the way the hypnotote or whatever you want to call it has been working for the TCU Horned Frogs, it's hard not to cheer for them tonight. Let me, before Phil, you ask Phil, going back to that Kansas State game they lost, I've never seen a more heroic performance in any sport than what the quarterback of TCU performed that day. He was a, he was a Heisman, Heisman candidate, and he did not win the Heisman, but based on that Kansas State game alone, he should have won the Heisman. Philly? I'm going with Georgia big time, man, and, and – I'll be honest with you, I'd, and and I give them credit for getting as far as they've gone. I kind of think Michigan was sleeping on them and maybe looking past them a little bit, and they had a, a lot of huge mistakes in that game. In Georgia, I think they're just too stacked. I, I just cannot see a path without some – like TCU playing their very best ball and Georgia playing their very worst ball. I think we're going to have a snoozer. We may be asleep by halftime. 13-point spread I just saw Colin brought up on uh, his computer screen, which I can see from the air studio. 
which is a pretty big spread. That's a backdoor cover. I'm taking Georgia. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to find an article because I want to bring up a point, if I remember correctly. I saw the top three largest spreads, and this one for Georgia TCU tonight, as you said, at 13 and a half, Rob, the largest ever. But the two right behind them, I'm trying to find because I believe I saw in those two games with the largest spread, it was actually the underdog that pulled out the win. Really? That's interesting. Uh, and a lot of times... I this... that one of those is West Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, back in the day with Bill Stewart. I'm talking about those, just championship. A... Yeah, yeah, oh, that, yeah, that wasn't a title game. Uh, but a lot of these title games aren't close. They get a lot of buildup, but a lot of times this is not a close game. Unless it's two SEC teams. <laughs> they know each other very well. Uh, so anyway, back to, back to the NFL then. And uh, a Monday Night Football playoff game, which is kind of odd, as you said, Bill. I mean, uh, Phil, it automatically puts that team at a disadvantage. But in the, in the past, the NFL, even when they do the Saturday-Sunday, you might play Sunday in the first round and have to play on Saturday the next week. So they, they've done, I know they did that to the Steelers in the past, too. So you're on a six-day week there, which is a disadvantage. This would not be unprecedented in terms of if you played Monday. I would assume there's no way they'd make you play the following Saturday. You'd have to be a Sunday game the next week. But I, it has happened. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't imagine. I just. I, for, I'm thinking the financial field has got to go to bed, and that's why it bugs, bugs me. <laughs> me too. I, I can't sit up there. If it's not the Pittsburgh, I can't sit up that late. Well, I'm with you. It's, I got to go to bed, and so that that's why it kind of bugs me. So that that game, I don't even know who it is. I just know that there's a, a Monday night game in Dallas, and I'm, I'm not even going to start. Yeah, and I especially don't want to watch that. The, uh, <laughs> but. The, uh, so I'm out, you know. So I'll, I'll have to find out what happened Tuesday morning when I call in to talk to you. Let you tell me what happened. By the way, I did find it. Yes. What do you have, Colin? 2001, Florida State was favored by 10 against Oklahoma. Oklahoma won that championship 13 to two. Sounds then, like a Pirates game. 2003, Miami was favored over Ohio State by 11. Ohio State won in double overtime, 31-24. 31-24. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Well, so that's, the that's last good. time it was double figures was actually 2013. And that was Bama by 10, and Bama dominated that game because it's Alabama. And they beat Notre Dame 42-14. Yep. Tony Petrucci still hasn't gotten over that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Sorry, Tony. I know he's on later today. He's on later today. <laughs> yeah. Notre Dame should not be allowed – in the Final Four weekend. I know they, they get in like every couple of years, and then they just flame out. They get killed. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tony. Do, do we know who the Steelers will be playing? There's, the Steelers did not make the playoffs. Make oh, the I thought playoffs. they did make the playoffs. No, the, the uh, Dolphins kicked a 50-yard field goal at the end of the game and knocked the Steelers out and put themselves in. Did you do that just to be mean? I think no, he did. No, no, was being no, no. I actually thought the Steelers were in. So I, I was watching basketball yesterday, so I did not follow the football. Yeah. Uh, Phil, yeah. while I have Colin here, by the way, Colin being a Commanders fan and you as, of course, you and I Steelers. Ah, but you know, the, I told him I wasn't going to bring that up because when I called in, he answered the phone. But first, I have to pat myself on the back a little bit. If you guys remember, last week I said the Steelers would win, Buffalo would win, but the Jets would lose and the Steelers wouldn't get in. That's exactly what happened. But I do have to say that I was exceptionally pleased with the win because that puts the Pittsburgh Steelers half a game ahead of the Washington <laughs> football team or whatever they are for the 22nd consecutive year since the day that I was married. I've had bragging rights over my friend Ron Branch. He can say nothing to me about the Pittsburgh Steelers. And, of course, the arrow is looking much better for the Steelers than it is, which it always is. But for the, for the uh, for the football team or commanders or whatever they are, so that's a win in itself. At least we didn't dip to the level to be below Washington. Go Steelers! Yeah, yeah, you can brag about it all he wants because both teams will have plenty of time sitting next to each other on the couches. <laughs> but, but I'm getting I'm, I'm kind of getting tired of bragging about it. after 22 years of half of my adult life. I've been talking to you. Know, no Redskin fan can say anything to me about my Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, the Steelers finished their season with Kenny Pickett, and they went, they went seven and two in their last night. But uh, Washington yesterday started Sam Howell, who ended up getting picked in what the fifth round, Colin. Yes, and he, I, he made a deep throw to Terry McLaurin that was as good as any deep throw you'll see. That was a bullet, man. He, he looked pretty good yesterday. 
Yeah, he did. So, I mean, yes, not making the playoffs is disappointing, especially when going into December, Washington was 7-5, and five, and it seemed like they were going to make the postseason. But ending the They'll season with a, a big win, <laughs> big win against Dallas at home in front of definitely a majority of Dallas Cowboy fans there at FedEx is something to, I guess, still be happy about and looking forward to hopefully being the last game for Washington with Dan Snyder as the owner. If you're Washington, anytime you beat Dallas, regardless of the records, that's a good day and it's a good year. The Steelers yesterday beat, beat the Browns. <laughs> <laughs> anytime you beat anybody when you're Washington fan, it's a good day. You mentioned Howell had a good throw. He also had a very good run as well for a touchdown. Yes. So I, this begs the question, will they take that and project him into the next year, or do they take a quarterback if one falls to them in the first round? They've got to take a quarterback. You know, <laughs> Neither one of the ones they had this year did anything. The good all. ones might all be gone by the time they pick, though. They usually are, right? Phil, let's talk money. Let's do it. That's because we got some interesting news on Friday, and that gave us a pretty nice rally for the stock market Friday. This morning, futures numbers are in uh, positive territory. We are still uh, for about 45 minutes away from the opening bell. What are we waiting for today? Decent momentum. And, and Friday, let's go back to Friday because it was kind of a mixed bag. Confused me for a moment. I think I sent you a copy of the article. But the unemployment rate remains low, and you think, oh, boy. And, you know, look, I, I don't want people to lose their jobs. That's not what I'm getting at. But I said, oh, boy, wonder what that's going to do. To but when you read the article, wages, the, the increase in wages has decrease and that that will ease some of the inflationary pressure and of course we know what that means because we've been talking about it for so long in the federal reserve and how they may read that but we're going to get cpi numbers this week and boy that's always been a huge day what's expected the overall number what's expected is 6.6 so that's the that's the number to pay attention we'll have a knee-jerk reaction one way or the other and we'll have to dive into that later on and say hey what what does this mean where does it come from is it food is it cars where where is it coming from whatever that number is but this week is a big big week because of that cpi number and we have some earnings so we got we got some good momentum going based off of and that you know that that was something i didn't expect to see uh, the unemployment rate remain low and and wages come down and and that's a good good sign i think for the markets I'm not saying I want people to make less money. I know sometimes people get mad at me for talking about this. I'm just deciphering what the, how the Federal Reserve is going to read it and what they're going to do with rates and because of that, and that is a good sign. Now, will we get – that's a leading indicator to what the CPI may be. Will we get confirmation of that on Thursday? That's going to dictate where we go for right now because we know the Federal Reserve, or we think we know anyway, that the Federal Reserve is either going to do a quarter of a percent or half a percent. If the CPI is lower, then that would give us, okay, they're going to go to a quarter percent. If it's higher, they still may go half a percent. And how our markets read that is going to be the determining factor. Phil, we've talked a lot about inflation over the last year, year and a half. Uh, We're talking less about it now than what we have done in the past. Is inflation under control, or does it look like it's going to have a handle on it? You're saying no, okay. No, it's not under control yet, but it's decreasing. So the rate of inflation is decreasing. It's still higher than what the Federal Reserve wants. but And and that's the big question. What they've done to this point, has it been enough to continue that decrease down to that level that they are happy with to a point maybe where they can even pivot? And that's a big – that would be a huge market boost if they, if they actually pivoted for a short time to get the, to boost the economy – our markets would really cheer that. It's not under control yet, but it sure as heck looks a lot better than it did back in July and August of 2022. I mean, we're if we get that, let's say we get the number that's expected at 6.6. That's in comparison to where where was its high point, 8.8 or something like that. So so the rate of decrease, as long as that continues to to come down quickly, and we see that on a month to month basis with the CPI and the PPI and all these numbers that we look at. That's what's positive. So it's not under control yet, but it's the longest way. It's like your fever's reducing. You still have a fever, and you're still sick, but it's not as high as it was yesterday. So the CPI is probably one of the best indicators for of inflation or the rate of inflation. Well, yeah, and that's you know that's that's a, the CPI gets all the attention, and it does seem to have more of a movement on the markets. But it has said that the PPI number 
is what the Federal Reserve pays attention to the most. But our markets, I think we move more off of, off of the CPI than we do the PPI. That that that, that seems to, to be what the markets look at. But they, it's said that the Federal Reserve pays more attention to the PPI. I, I don't know. I know that one leads into the other. I know that. I know that. So if you if you get a, a CPI or PPI and you say, well, that that kind of tells me what the other is going to be, or it should, anyway. But the the CPI has been a, the market mover to this point. I mean, every every big day that sticks out in my head over the past six months has been based off that CPI number. I think there was a Wall Street Journal this morning that was predicting that um, the tech sector in particular is going to be seeing decreased earnings and increased layoffs in the coming months. Did, are you familiar with that? And any ideas of what the the results will be? Well, that would be expected. And I don't know that that's, that's an indicator because we have to remember that our markets look forward. So when we see decreases, and it's almost always the case, if a company announces layoffs, that that stock typically jumps because that's an indication that they're going they're making moves to make more money so from the standpoint of how healthy is the sector and how's the stock reacting to it it could be two different stories you could hear that hey this company is has has decreased earnings and they've got layoffs but they've got positive forward-looking statements and then the market would rally or that stock would rally based off that i wouldn't be surprised though because the tech sector has been hurt really, really bad through all this because of, by and large, it's growth-oriented, and growth companies are impacted more by the movement of interest rates. So, And that's a long, drawn-out math equation, but growth companies are impacted more by that. And, we, and we've seen that over the last, especially last year, you know, the Dow outperformed, which is full of value or has more value than, than the NASDAQ. And that's just simply because of a rotation. Remember that word? We used to use that a lot back in 2020, a rotation, which meant we're going to rotate out of growth companies into value companies. And we saw that come to fruition, even though both, uh, neither one of them performed on a positive level. But you were much happier if your portfolio was full of value companies in 2022 than it, if you were if it was full of growth companies. A year, a year ago, Phil, uh, the market, I think, everything was responding to uh, the threat of Russia uh, invading Ukraine. Uh, that's more or less been discounted now, uh, at least the, the market response to it. What about China and Taiwan? Are we looking at uh, something similar? It doesn't seem to have a huge impact right now uh, on, our, on our markets. And if we rewind back to Russia and Ukraine, we... We were reacting to that, but not as much as the same story as we got right now with inflation and the Federal Reserve. And I remember when Russia, and of course everybody does, when Russia actually invaded Ukraine, look at what the stock market did the following month. It actually had a pretty good month. And it wasn't because Mr. Wall Street was happy that that happened. It was because it slowed the Federal Reserve down. It delayed their increase in rates, which ultimately led to uh, th these huge increases of three quarters of a percent because that was something that delayed our markets or, or delayed the Federal Reserve. And that was a delay right after Omicron and right after the Delta variant. All those things were delayed, which led to the three quarters of a percent increase from the Federal Reserve. So, and, and it could be the same thing with China and ta Taiwan right now. I don't know that it, it does have a huge impact on our markets right now because we're so hyper focused on Jerome Powell. James Bullard and the like, and what inflation readings look like. Financial Phil is our guest here on the program from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriads Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg, and maybe soon in Frederick, too. I don't know. Uh, talk to John about that next minute. Uh, let's talk about oil, Phil, because uh, be regarding China, it was mentioned earlier by Bill with China and Taiwan, uh, some of the other news about China regarding the uh, reopening of their borders with the COVID situation has caused uh, a spike in oil prices today because the theory being demand will soon pick up again. So oil prices have risen today by over 3%. So now it's 70, I guess, six bucks a barrel. Uh, so as that continues, are we looking then again at gas prices moving their way back up around $4 a gallon? We've already seen them spike up back into the uh, lower half of the mid threes here over the last couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully not. You know, when we look back on, on the summer months, a lot of that was 
from worldwide demand from reopening. Now it's kind of China's in the reopening. I don't know that it would have the same impact as it did back in the summer because everybody was that. Like, we all just came out of our cocoon, and we didn't care what the price of oil was. So the, the, the China story is twofold. On one hand, you have increased demand for oil, but on the other hand, you have opening up of supply chains. So, so you could have increased oil prices as long as it doesn't get to the point where it's prohibited. But we don't really we, – we know that there's a point where everybody's kind of – everybody's complaining, but at the same time, everybody's happy with the price. As long as we don't get back up to where we were before, four or five bucks a gallon, I don't think that it really matters that there's a difference between 290 a gallon and 350 a gallon. I don't know that it really matters, quite honestly. But it is going to open up some – it's going to relieve some of the supply chain issues that we've had because of them being shut down the way that they were. So that that story is twofold. On one hand, it's like, eh, it's going to put some pressure on oil. But on the other hand, it could start to open things up where we're getting these chips and we can get – that could help the auto industry. And it, it could help a lot of things that we weren't – I still don't have the spare key to a car that we bought six months ago because they can't get the chips. I'm hopefully now I can get that before too long. But so that is a, two, a, a twofold story. One hand, it kind of hurts. And on the other hand, it kind of helps. So the average price of a new car is about forty-eight thousand dollars. The average price of a used car is around thirty-one. Both of those price tags have come down slightly, very slightly, but slightly from last year. Phil, do you read anything into that, or is the fact that they're just still so highly priced? It doesn't matter that they came down. We're, it does matter, and the, and the continued decrease from the used car side is, I think, will, will garner extra attention. And we'll get some of that in our CPI numbers. The, the used car market had such a large impact, huge impact, on those inflation readings. I didn't really ever think that the, that one market could have such a huge impact, but it did. And if those used car prices come down, we know what's to follow, which is the new cars, because they kind of compete against each other. And so th that would be something that's really important. See, remember, we talked about those little nuggets inside the CPI report. That's one of them with the price of auto automobiles and used cars. And I would imagine there's still going to be some demand. There should be some pent-up demand for autos because it's been so difficult to, to, to find what you're looking for. You either had to settle or not get something at all or, or pay too much for it. There was all these things, uh, concessions that you had to make as a consumer, and a lot of people didn't make those concessions, probably wisely so, didn't make those concessions. So now as prices start to come down and inventory opens up and you can get kind of what you want, that should the, the demand should increase, but where is it going to come from? It's probably going to be on the new car side. If I buy a house, regardless of the price, I know that over the course of time when I go to sell it, it most likely will be worth more than what I bought it for. So I don't regard it as something that hurts my investment portfolio in the short term or the long term really all that much. I, I guess you could make an argument for short term a little bit. But when I buy a car, it's it's with the exception of, a, of, of about – the last two or three years, when I buy a car, it is generally considered a depreciating asset. But when yes. I was buying a new car for twenty something thousand dollars, that was one thing. If I'm buying a new car for fifty something thousand dollars, that takes a lot of money out of my pocket that I need I could use to for investing, fill, or saving or any other purpose, charity, whatever. There's a lot of downfield effects from a fifty thousand dollar average new car purchase. And it's not just the purchase of the new car either, because most people borrow money for that. So look at the interest rates right now. And so if you're buying a new car, not only are they so much more expensive than what they were a few years ago, but the rate of interest that you would pay to purchase that new car is so, so much higher than what it was before as well because of what the Federal Reserve had done. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today, sir? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us right here in Martinsburg, 1270 Winchester Avenue. Phil, what's your pick for the Steelers next week? Uh, they're, they're gonna, it's going to be a draw next week. <laughs> on the couch beside the, the Washington team. Right, right beside Colin on the couch. <laughs> Just a little bit higher. <laughs> half a game, half a game. <laughs> Thank you, Phil.